I realize as I begin to really dig in to study the word, this is not just a book. There is so much here. There's so much supernatural that's here. God has a message for each one of us. The Bible, the word of God, the word of God. And so we're going to talk about that today, a little, little side note on our, on our typical studies. So praise the Lord. Father, we love you and praise the Lord. Thank you for your faithfulness and your love, Lord. And thank you for this beautiful day you've given us, Lord. Thank you for the family as we gather together in your name. Lord, we love you. So Lord, we ask, Lord, that you'd speak to us through your word, through this time together. We look to you in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen, amen and amen. Yes, we are going to talk about the Bible a little bit, kind of the bigger picture before we, before we zero down once again on particular passages and look at these stories and look at what God has for us. The bigger picture is, is think about this, 66 books that we have right here by 40 different authors. We're talking about three different continents, three different languages. This comes in over about a 2,000 year period. Listen to the, those that pen this book. We have priests and prophets and princes, uh, princesses, prince, princes, okay, peasants and warriors and statesmen and herdsmen and poets and publicans and, re, and uh, not Republicans, but publicans. <laughs> you definitely want to see Democrats in this group. Okay. <laughs> Whatever. Okay. <laughs> Only you guys, all right? Physicians and fishermen and historians and lawyers and philosophers and aristocrats and exiles and rich and poor and evangelists, apostles written to the Jews and to the, to the Gentiles, written to the Greeks and the barbarians, to bond, to free, to, to men, to women, to young, old, to individuals, to congregations, and to the whole world. That's the word of God. And yet something, something miraculous about this, something supernatural about this word of God. Think about this. Think about what the topic is in this book. It's all about the things of God, the story of God, the story of God's interaction with, with mankind. And yet you have it from different languages, different people groups, different backgrounds. And 66 of these books, do you think that, do you think that there's got to be a divine origin in this? Because here's the thing, how can you get 66 authors from this big big wide range of people and they're all going to agree on a very controversial topic and that is who is God? The story of God. Could we do that even in this room? Could we take 10 of you at random? You guys all know for, for the most part, you know the same language, you're in the same geographical area, some of the same backgrounds and all that. But what if we say we want you to write just, just a five page, art, five page article on who is God? 10 of you, only 10 of you, not 66 of you, we'll put it together. Would they contradict each other? Would they complement each other? See, I, th I think we need to understand what Chuck Missler said. I love this guy. I miss him a lot. He was a good friend of the ministry here. He said, the great discovery is that the Bible is a message system. It's not simply 66 books penned by 40 authors over thousands of years. The Bible is an integrated whole which bears evidence of supernatural engineering in every detail. Amen. The Jewish rabbis have a quaint way of expressing this very idea. They say that they will not understand the scriptures until Messiah comes. But when he comes, he will not only interpret each of the passages for us, he will interpret the very words. He will even interpret the very letters themselves. In fact, he'll even interpret the spaces between the letters. I love that. I love that. I miss this guy, a good friend of ours. If you've been in our church for a long time, you know you've met him because he's been here a lot over the years. But this is uh, what we study. And I think sometimes as Christians, we need to back up a little bit and understand what we are studying, what we're reading, what we devote, do our devotions with is supernatural. God, God's message to his kids. I remember years ago when I was a fairly new Christian and yet I knew God was calling me uh, to understand what this Bible had to say. So I thought, and I heard a bunch of you, a bunch of pastors say this, but you Christians would say this, well, where should I start in the Bible? And back in those days, they said, start in the book of Revelation. Now, I don't know that I would start people in the book of Revelation now, all right? Let's start in the book of Revelation. So I said, all right, I'll start in the book of Revelation. I was taking the light rail. I was taking the light rail. It was brand new in Sacramento. And I was taking that into town every morning. So I had an hour on my way to work and an hour back. And so I started with, I started with my Bible. I started with Chuck, Chuck Missler cassette tapes. 
Remember those? Okay, cassette tapes. I, I had, so I did Chuck Smith, I did Chuck Missler, and I did Raul Reese. If you know those names, okay, you have a guy that's just grace upon grace, and that's Chuck Smith, and, and kind, of, kind of approaches the word of God in grace. You have Raul Reese is like in your face. If you're not following Jesus, he's in your face, you know, and I like that guy. He's been a good friend for a lot of years. And then Chuck Missler. Chuck Missler is more of the mystic, more of the guy that looking. Let's look at every single word. Let's look at every single detail. And I got to say this, it only took me about um, probably three or four days of doing this that I began to open the Bible differently. I realized as I began to really dig in to study the word, this is not just a book. There is so much here. There's so much supernatural that's here. God has a message for each one of us. I think it's good to back up and look at the bigger picture sometimes to understand what we do is supernatural. What we read here is God's word to us. And I want to talk to you a little bit about that today. I want to, I want to talk about this question. Has God spoken to us? Has God spoken to us? Now, I'm going to go pastor on you. I don't do this very often. It's pretty rare that I'll do something like this. But I'm going to give you 10 ways that God speaks to us, all right? All right? And you could probably add another 15 because I had a whole bunch more than this, but I hit the, the top ones. How is God speaking to us? Think about this. We have God's, and we're ultimately going to get to, yes, God is speaking to us through his word. But here's the first thing is this, is that God speaks to us through nature, through nature. The Bible says in, in Psalms 19, he says, the heavens declare the glory of God and his firmament show his handiwork. The heavens declare the glory of God. Look up. Some, you know, go out when you go camping or you get outside and look up. Look at the stars. And in fact, there's something there. Again, there's something that, that God shows up in is when you're out there and you're alone and you're looking up and you're seeing the stars. Just a minute, begin to connect with God and watch how God, God connects with us. I know what the psalmist meant when he says, when I look at the heavens, the work of your hands, who am I that you're mindful of me? And I understand that when you, when you stand out there and look at the things that God created from the heavens and all those things. Or in the book of Romans, it says, for since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have clearly been seen, being understood through the things he made so that we are without excuse. Who God is and what he's, what he's up to can be seen through his creation. He's a creator God. He's a God that loves us through nature. Through nature, we see, has God spoke to us? Well, just slow down a little bit and look around. Look what he's done. Here's another thing. Here's the second thing is this. Is that God speaks to us through, through our conscience, through our conscience. There's a God-shaped void in each one of us, a God-shaped void. Romans 2 says this, for when the Gentiles who do not have the law, that don't understand God's, God's principles and God's law, by nature they do the things that are in the word, in the law, these, although not having the law, are a law to themselves. Okay, that's cool. So uh, who shows the work of the law, listen to this, what God has for us, he shows them written in their hearts. Their conscience, is, their conscience also bearing witness between themselves and, and, and their thoughts accusing or excusing them. Our conscience. I don't know. I never played that, that game that, that, you know, there is no heaven, there is no hell, there is no, there is no God. I never had that. I always knew there was a God, even since I was a kid. Maybe because I had a grandma, that you, I had a, had a Pentecostal grandma that was praying for us. And you heard me talk about this before, but I had a Pentecostal grandma praying for us little pagan kids. You know, I think she was praying, please don't let them set my house on fire, God. You know, because we were mean, mean little kids. But I always had, I've always had a conscience of God. There's always been, not that, I, not that I wanted to know him or walk with him or have anything to do with you Christians at all. I just knew there was a God and I didn't know how to find him. But in that conscience, that, somebody called it that God-shaped void. In that God-shaped void, in other words, in that void in my soul that only God could fill. There was always something, always something more. I know there's got to be more to this life than just living and dying. There's got to be something more. There's got to be someone that created these things. And that conscience drew me to him. That conscience drew me to him. 
The Bible says if you'll seek, you will find. You'll run right straight into Jesus, and I did. That conscience, is there a God? Yes, he put that void in our lives. It's very cool if you guys are readers and be readers, all right? There's a really good book. It's called uh, Eternity in Their Hearts, uh, Don Richardson. Is that right, Don Richardson? Yes. So Eternity in Their Hearts, great book. Here, here's a guy, that's, he's, docu- he's a missionary, but he's actually documenting missionaries that go into areas where there has been no gospel presence. There hasn't been anybody that has gone into those, those places and told these people about God, about Jesus, and he goes in there, and how did this happen? They already knew about God. That people group already knew about the flood stories and some of the stories in our Bible. They already knew about, about the saving grace of a God that would save them. And they come in, and they say, you already, and say we, already, we already know this. We already know this. Well, let me tell you about Jesus. Let me tell you what he did upon that cross. You know, God has placed it in our hearts. Now, I don't know, you know, for you guys that are here or those online watching, but, but it, God has placed in us uh, this, this place of, of there's something more in this life. There's something more. It's not just, we're not just, and, and maybe you feel that something more with, with the world, with materialism or jobs or kids or family or, or a lot of good things you can fill that void with. But I tell you what, at the end of the day, nothing will fill that void like God. Your spouse will not fill that void in your life. Sometimes that's, that's a revelation in itself. You know, when your, your wife, your husband will not fill that void in your life. They cannot be your all in all in the sense of everything. With, God's the only one that can do that. And then when you love God, you can love your spouse like Christ loves the church, the Bible says. You can love, you can do those things. Our conscience, our conscience. What else? Here's a cool one. God, does God speak to us today? Is God, does God speak to us in the word? Yes. Does he speak to us? Yes. Through dreams and visions? Wow, the Bible says this. It shall come to pass in the last, in the last days, God said, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions and your old men shall dream dreams. I like that. I was, I was seeing visions earlier and now I'm dreaming dreams. The old man will dream dreams. God can speak to us through those things. Uh, there is, uh, and again, I'll just kind of keep you guys activated in learning. Be a learner. Uh, there's, and I put it online for you. There is some great videos. They're called More Than Dreams. More Than Dreams. Does this ring a bell for anybody? Okay. You guys got to get out more. All right. So, <laughs> all right. So More Than Dreams. So what is this? this these are great stories. These are stories of, of uh, people I watched one yesterday of people in Middle Eastern countries or countries that are completely locked down. There is no speaking about Jesus. And if they think you're becoming converted to a Christian, uh, some of these countries will kill you, right? It's completely locked down. And you see how God shows up. God shows up in dreams, in visions, shows up. Do you think God is limited? God is able to reach people. Sometimes that's the, that's the smoke screen that they throw up, but people throw up and go, go, well, what about Jesus? Well, what about the pygmy in the bush that didn't, never heard about God? Well, what about that person? I tell you this, the Bible says, if you'll seek, you will find. If you start seeking, God will, it's like, the, it's like maybe this, this is a good analogy. It's like, the, it's like the mouse looking for the cat, all right? You start looking, he'll find you. You start looking, or maybe this is a better one, uh, it, um, Oh, I got, I, I'm, getting, I'm getting old. It is, um, what's his name? Ooh, not Bruce Lee, but the other guy. Chuck Norris. Man, nursing home is in my future, right? It's like Chuck Norris. It's like Chuck Norris, right? You don't look, have you ever Googled this? You know, where's Chuck Norris? Google that. It says, you can't find Chuck Norris, he'll find you. It's great, I love that, all right? See, you'll find God. God shows up. Does God show up in visions and dreams and in the, in the supernatural way? Absolutely, he can do that. Now, always check. It will never contradict the word of God. Okay, if he, if he shows up and, and gives you some new doctrine, a new way of looking at things, if it doesn't line up with God's word, you know, he's not gonna contradict this. In fact, he said, in fact, it says in here, it says if you add or take away from the word of God, that's a bad day for you. The Bible says that the curses will be added to you, you know, and so you don't want to, you don't want to be adding or taking away. Does it? And so this is, this is our, our, our rule. So now here's the thing. Does it line up with what God's word says? 
you know, if it lines up with God's word, then I want to hear what it has to say. And so you have that. Here's another way. Here's the fourth thing. And yes, I got 10. We'll go through them pretty quickly. Uh, here's the fourth thing is that God, can, God does speak to us. Does he speak today? Yes. Can he speak to us even audibly? Even audibly. Absolutely. We see that. We see that with, with the baptism of Jesus, the transfiguration of Jesus. We see that Saul on the road to Damascus. Can he do that? Can he do that? Absolutely. Can God speak to us audibly? I think, uh, at least in, in my world, it's only been when I have not been listening. When I am too, too focused on, uh, on some things that, that God had to speak to me, and I, and, and I have to say, it, was, it's, it, it seemed to me it was audible. It was, let me just say it this way. It was loud when God was trying to get my attention. There's only been a couple times, and it was key times in my life that, that I needed to fix some things. And I was not listening. I was not listening to anyone that was, was trying to correct or help me correct what I was doing. None of that. And it was almost audible if it wasn't audible. Can God speak to us that way? Yes, he can. Is God, you know, are we going to put God in a box where he can't reach people? He can reach people. He does. He does. I also think we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna find out this, that God is not as, as, as narrow as we think he is. I think God really loves people. God so loved the world, the cosmos. He so loved people. This is how much he loved that he gave his only begotten son. And that whosoever will come to him and whosoever will believe in him will have eternal life. God loves people. Lord, help us to do that. Maybe, you know, John got this. John the apostle got this. At the end of his life, Look at, look at the first and second and third John, the letters that he wrote, and look how many times he talks about love. Talks about love. The last thing we know about John is he was brought into the church there at Ephesus, brought into church. He lifted up his head and he said, little children, love one another. Love. Help us to love one another. Audible. Do you speak to audible? Yes. Here's the fifth thing. This is that he speaks to us through theophanies. Theophanies. Do you know what that is? Those are pretty supernatural moments, and we're going to talk about that on Wednesday night coming up. It's where Jesus walks off the pages of the New Testament straight into the, the pages of the Old Testament. Does, is Jesus in the Old Testament? Yeah. Stay tuned. Yes, he is. He shows up at times. And these are, these are bizarre Twilight Zone moments. There's some really cool stuff in the Bible. There's one coming up in our study in the book of Joshua. Who fought the, who fought the, the battle of Jericho? We, remember, some of you are really, really old. Do you remember? Joshua fought the battle of Jericho, Jericho, Jericho. Joshua fought the battle of Jericho, and the walls come tumbling down. How many of you remember that song? Oh, look at you, look at you. There's a, this is, because this is the old service. That's why. This is where, <laughs> that's why. Man, this is the Jericho bunch. All right, so praise the Lord, I'm with you. So Theophanes. So does God show up? Yes. Does God speak? Yes. And even, even Jesus shows up in the Old Testament. That's a, cool, that's a cool study. That's coming up on Wednesday night. How about this one? Does God speak to us? Yes. He speaks to us through angels, through angels, through that still small voice. We run through a few of these, through that still small voice, you know, miracles, events. God will show up through miracles. He'll show up through Jesus. Of course. Hebrews 1 says, God, who at the various times in various ways spoke in times past to the fathers by the prophets in these last days have spoken to us by his son, whom he has appointed heirs of all things. In these last days, he's spoken to us by his son. Here's the last one. I want to get over to this one is the Bible. The Bible. Does God speak to us through the word of God, through the Bible? Yes, if we'll just listen. If we'll just listen to what he has to say to us. The word of God is alive and active and sharper than any, any two-edged sword, the Bible says, about itself. It's cutting right to, the, right to the marrow of our souls, the word of God. When Paul's talking to those in, in Thessalonica, in 1 Thessalonians 2, he says, For this reason we also gave thanks without, without ceasing, because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you welcomed it, not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which is also effectively works in you who believe. It's the word of God who works in you who believe. The word of God, 66 books, the Bible. Does God speak to us today? Yes. And you could probably come up with a couple other ways. Let me just remind you of this, is that God will speak to us, but he will not contradict his word. 
He will not ask you to do something that's out, outside of your word or, or even, even uh, uh, something weird that's outside of your conscience, you know. And so God's not going to ask you to do something, you know, that way. Um, but God does show up. How do you think I got here in Utah, you know? <laughs> really? Utah? Who would, who would, well, I shouldn't say this to you guys, but who would, who would purposely come to Utah? All right, maybe a job is cool. It's a little better now. Let's talk 20 years ago. Let's talk 30 years ago. Okay, when we were coming here, who in their right mind would come to Utah 30 years ago? All right? Just saying, you did, yeah, you did, yeah, I did, I did. I regret it ever since there. Pastor, help me, you know? No, here's the thing, but God will lead us. Praise God that we came to Utah. I wouldn't know you nice people, all right? That's the deal. I'm glad he came. You know, I'm glad, I'm, glad, I'm glad he had us come here, all over Sacramento to come here. But God will lead us. He will guide us if we'll just trust in him. Now, here's the deal, is that the word of God, let's, let's zero in more on this. 66 books. Okay, so out of, these, out of these books, why just these books? Why just these? Isn't there other, pastor, isn't there other books that we ought to be looking at? Aren't there others? What about the Catholic Bible? Have you ever had a Catholic Bible? How, let, me, let me think, before, before we just brush this aside, the Catholic Bible has a, a section between, between where we have Malachi and between Matthew, there are some other books in there. They're called, the, what are they called? The Apocrypha. The Apocrypha. Okay, the Old Testament, New Testament, the Apocrypha books. The Apocrypha books. Do you know this? When the King James Bible was first, was first translated, and, and in 1611, the very first trans, uh, the very, very first King James Bible had the Apocrypha in it. You'll see one of those Bibles, the 1611 Bible. That is, that is not, uh, that is a replica of a Bible out there. It's in those cases. You ever look at those cases? Okay, go look at those cases. Those are awesome. In those cases, you'll find uh, a 1611 King James Bible. You'll see it's a great giant Bible, and you'll see it open there. And that's that's and the Apocrypha was in that. Now, without getting too hung up in this, we could do an hour on this, is what are these books? Let me tell you what they are. They're great for history. They're not so good for doctrine, and you'll see why as you just read through them. You'll read, you'll read about here the Maccabeans. The Maccabean revolt is what happened. What happened between Malachi and Matthew? Well, there was a big revolt that took place in Jerusalem. But, but the thing is this, is that angels and demons and, and supernatural things, they were waiting for the coming of Messiah during that time. But you have this Maccabean revolt where, you have the, the, where we celebrate Hanukkah today. Okay, Do you know about that? Jesus celebrated Hanukkah. We find that in the scriptures. And so you have the Hanukkah. But I like some of these other stories you have in that. You have Bella the dragon. That's a great story. Just in a, in a nutshell is how do you kill a dragon? Kill him with a fur ball. All right. It's actually a pretty cool story in there. All right. It's, it's Bell and the dragon and, and they had a dragon problem and how they deal with it. And then Daniel, you know, Daniel from the Old Testament, Daniel uh, told him to take a big fur ball, take hair and take pitch and take and take lard, take fat, make this ball, get in there in the in the in this in the in the in the dragon will eat it and will die. That actually will work. <laughs> Try it on your, your neighbor's cat, all right? A little <laughs> just a little fur ball and it'll eat it because it can't it can't die. Oh whatever. That little cat is a nuisance, all right? So it'll, it can't digest it, all right? Whatever, you didn't like me anyways, all right? So, <laughs> Bell the Dragon. So, so these stories in there. Let me tell you this, those aren't, those aren't gonna, I'm not gonna tell you that those aren't, that, that you shouldn't read those, those are something you should, you know, they're actually pretty, uh, some pretty good stories. What'll happen is when you read them, you'll start realizing pretty quickly of why they're not in the Bible. Okay, why they weren't part of the canon of scriptures, they call it, why they're not in the Bible, All right? And so, uh, and you'll read them. How about these? How about these guys? How about these guys? How about these lost books of the Bible? All the lost books, books of the Bible, okay? The, the Gnostic Gospels, or the Gospel of Judas. What about these guys? Shouldn't, uh, isn't some of these books removed, as Dan Brown would say, in the Da Vinci Code books. Shouldn't some of these books be put in the Bible because the early church, the early church fathers, they removed them out of the Bible because they were going to tell some of their secrets. Is any of that true? 
Not at all. Not at all. And let me tell you, well, well, how do we know it's not true? Well, let's pick on, let's pick on a couple of these real quick. Okay, the Gospel of Thomas. This is one of the ones, and if you and if you really pin somebody down, okay, so tell me a book that should be in the Bible that's not in the Bible. Gospel of Thomas will usually come up in the top five right away. Gospel of Thomas should be in the Bible. That should not be outside the Bible, that should be in the Bible. Okay, great. Have you ever read it? No, but it should be in there. All right. Gospel of Thomas. The Gospel of Thomas is, is, a, is 114 secret sayings of Jesus. 114 secret sayings of Jesus. Let me just read a couple of these. This should be in your Bible, all right? I think we're missing out by not having these. Listen to this. Here's, here is secret number seven out of the, and you can Google this. You can read along with me. You go online and Google this. The Gospel of Thomas, secret number seven is this. It says, Jesus said, Jesus said, lucky is the lion that the human will eat so that the lion becomes human. And foul is the human that the lion will eat and the lion will become human. All right, so secret seven of Jesus. The number seven is this. If you eat, this makes sense. Okay, first part makes sense. If you eat a lion, then the lion becomes part of you. Okay, okay, that's okay, whatever, that's cool. All right, you are what you eat, all right? Okay, flip that around now. But if the lion eats you, the lion becomes human. Wow, I never saw that happen. Okay, how about this one? This one, this one is not just psycho. This one, I think, is blasphemous. Here, here it is. The 14th secret saying in the gospel, this one right here, this should be in our Bible. Jesus said to them, if you fast, if you fast, remember fasting? Jesus taught about fasting. If you fast, you will bring sin upon yourself. If you pray, you will be condemned. And if you give to charity, you will harm your spirit. That's a lie from the devil. That's a, that's a direct contradiction from what Jesus taught us. All right, here's a better, here, here's, let me just get one more here because these are just fun to read. Entertaining. You ought to get one and put that in that room where you read a lot at, where you do your phone text in. You ought to read one of these. All right. Simon Peter said to them, listen, this, this is the last one. This is the grand finale of them. This is the, 104, the 114th secret saying of Jesus out of the Gospel of Thomas. Uh, Simon Peter said to them, Mary, listen, Simon said to them, Mary, make, oh, no, slow it down. Okay, Simon Peter said to them, make Mary leave us for females don't deserve life. That's Simon Peter saying that. Jesus said, look, I will guide her to make her male so that she too may become a living spirit resembling you males. For every female who makes herself male will enter the kingdom of heaven. <laughs> wow, you are a psycho. Oh, that, so when, so, when some of, I just, I smile. They say, well, that book, and even Dan Brown says this, if you remember, because that Da Vinci Code was a big thing in a, in a, for, for a season. But this is one of the things, that, that book should be in there. Have you ever just read it? Just read it. You read it, you see, okay, well, that's kind of crazy. Okay, let me do just a couple more of these. We'll quit on this. Is this, the Gospel of Peter. Well, don't we have other gospel writers? Yeah, the Gospel of, the, the gospel of Peter. All right, the Gospel of Peter. Well, that's kind of cool. I don't even need to read this one. I'll just tell you what it is. Is that you can go, and all these you can read online. The Gospel of Peter is, also has a nickname for those that have read it. It says the Talking Cross Gospel. Because when they were going in, to the tomb to look for the body of Jesus, two angels came out. Now the angels are interesting in the description. They, they're, they're so large that their heads go up into the clouds that they can only see their bodies. All right, well that's kind of cool. How do you get in that tomb? And I don't know how that works. But when they came out of the tomb, what followed them was the cross. So they came out of the tomb, following them <laughs> was the cross, and they, they looked back at the cross and the cross began to talk to them. All right, the talking cross gospel. All right, yeah, that's just, that's just crazy. Oh, that should be in the Bible. No, that's weird. That's, it's almost like the, the devil throws this stuff out right, right in the face and say, look, they'll believe anything to not believe the Bible. Right. You know. And so there's another one. I didn't put a picture up here. The, the, and this one comes up a lot. It's called the Secret Gospel of Mark. Okay, the Secret Gospel of Mark, it became huge, famous. Uh, the Secret Gospel of Mark that was missing. 
The secret of the gospel, when, when that became so famous, the guy that forged that thing came out and said, it's all a scam. You guys believe anything. And it's all a scam. This is how I did it. This is a forgery. This is not real. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. The, the truth doesn't matter. The light is spun over and over again and find some of these, these technical journals and stuff on the Bible. The, these books that should be removed, that comes up. Even quoted many times. These, these scriptures should be in the Bible. That was, the, the guy that did, it was the hoax, the guy that did the hoax said he, it was a hoax. He did it and showed him how he did it. How about this one that came out a few years ago, this lost book of Judas. This wasn't lost. This was thrown out in the very early church. It's about, it goes to about 300, about 300 AD. Doesn't go into that time period at all. It has an agenda. There was a cultic group that had an agenda to, to really, let me just say it straight out, that had an agenda to badmouth Jesus and make Judas is the hero. So in this book, Judas is the hero. Jesus manipulated the hero, but Judas is the hero of this thing. And you can read some of that, all that online. Now, so you have this, and so, so let me, we're not going to throw out all the early church fathers, all right? I got to do this quickly, right, because I'm running out of time. So we have the 66 books. What about the Apocrypha? The Apocrypha is fine. It's just, it's not good for doctrine. It's good for history. It kind of fills in the gap between Malachi and Matthew. But you read it, and you'll begin to see very quickly why it's not in the Bible. What about these other lost books of the Bible? They were never lost. They were thrown away, right? They weren't lost, right? But let me show you how this works. You have, you have Jesus, and then you have the apostles. You have the apostles. And then from there, you have the next generation. You have the generation under Paul, Clement of Rome, or Peter, or John with Polycarp, uh, you know, and, and, and some of these others. And so what you have is, in the early church father writings, what you have is they're not scripture. They are those that follow the apostles, and it's their stories. Uh, I don't have time now, but the, like the one of Polycarp, absolutely worth your time. Polycarp is a, is a, is a, is a student of John, right? And he's the next generation. Polycarp, burned at the stake because of his belief in Jesus, right? And he told the emperor, he said, 80, the emperor, young, man, old man, you can die in your bed. You don't have to be killed. And he says, 86 years have I served him and never once has my Lord denied me. Do you ask me to deny him now? I won't deny him. He says, well, you are gonna, you are gonna burn and the, and the pain of burning, do you want that? And he says, well, my burning will just go for just a moment. Your burning will go for eternity. And they said, okay, that's the end of that. So they burned this guy at the stake. Why he becomes such a, 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 a player in the early church fathers is he was a writer. So he wrote uh, several of, of uh, these, these documents on what was going on in the early church, how to, how to, what they were saying about scripture and that. Every, every book of the, of the New Testament, can, you, you'll find a piece of it in his writings, right? So you see quite a bit with, with Polycarp and these others. So you don't throw them all out. You just understand how this thing works. It works this way, is that the Bible, the Bible is the word of God. This, this has what God has for us. But then you have the next generation, they're not the lost books of the Bible. You have the next generation. And those are writing about what was going on in the church. They're, they're writing, you know, this is what we're learning. And then the next generation. We have that today. We have tons of authors today that are writing about uh, things that they're discovering about God and, and ways to come closer to God. And every generation has them. So you don't want to throw those out. In fact, let's, let me go to right here. See if I can do this. Not there, not there, not there. Okay. Let's talk, let's, let's just finish this up right here. As the Bible says this in the book of Hebrews, it says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and the sin which clings to us so closely. Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and the perfecter of our faith. Since we, have, we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, we have those that have gone before us. Does God speak in Bible times, yes. Does God speak today? Yes. He's given us his word. Can we trust it? Now, some of the things I was talking about, these other books and stuff, that's kind of foundational. What, where I want to go next with you guys, and I'll do it next week, is about the man. So what do we have here? What are the manuscripts of the Bible? Why do we have King James, New King James, New American Standard? Why are those? Let's go, I'm going to get a little bit more technical with you next time, because I think we need to understand why do we have these different 
these different versions of the Bible? Okay, what are the manuscripts? Why do some of our Bibles say older manuscripts don't have this section? What is that all about? Stay tuned. We need to understand some of this stuff. And then we'll go back to our studies. But I think there's times we need to do the big flyover. Let's look at the bigger picture. Why this book? Okay. Has God ever even really spoke to us? Is this the books? Is these the, the books that we ought to be reading? Isn't there other books we should be reading? And we need to do a little flyover to say, yes. Okay. Yes, we can trust what God has here. And what I did about these other books I've done in the past, and we could spend hours in kind of unpackaging those. But I hope you got a flavor of, to understand that what we have right here in the 66 books by 40 different authors over 2,000 years, written on three continents and three languages, it is, it is an integrated message system. Thank you, Chuck Missler. Uh, an integrated message system to us from God. Amen. Now, can we trust it? Now, now, okay, so all of that, with all that said, what should we do? You ought to read it. You ought to read this thing. You ought to read this thing. You ought to go, you ought to start in the beginning. I would not, now if you're new, if you're new to the Bible, I would not say start in the book of Revelation. If you want to, go for it. It's good. It's all safe, you know. But if you want to, let me tell you this. If you want to understand the book of Revelation a little better, start in the Gospels or start in Genesis or start in both of them. You know, start in both of them. Do a chap, couple chapters in Genesis, a couple chap, chapters in Matthew and get on a reading schedule where you're reading this thing. Because you do know this, this book right here only takes, and this is a slow reader, it only takes 80 hours to read the entire Bible. 80 hours, that's it. That's not very long. Okay, you watch Walking Dead for how many hours? How many episodes did you watch? Or whatever program you got, you got stuck in? All right, so, Lord help us. All right, I, gotta, I hate the clock. I got to pause it there. We're going to come back. And now I'm going to, part two now on this is I'm going to continue going because I, I do want you, before we get done this, this week and next week, I want you to be able to say, okay, this is the word of God. This is, this, is where the man, this is what the manuscripts are. If you're not familiar with that, come back next week. We'll talk about it. Okay, and this is why, this is, this is some of the reasons why we have these books. And yes, God has spoken to us. Good stuff? I don't know. I'm in, uh, yeah, I like it. Yeah, pray, praise the Lord. Yes, thank you, Jesus. We have a cloud of witnesses. Father, thank you so much for those, Lord, that have gone before us, Lord, that have paid the price, as we saw even in that little video that we watched. But Lord, your word, your word. Lord, I do pray, Lord, that you would help us to follow you, to trust in you, Lord. Lord, we're all learning. We're all on a journey. Lord, we're all learning. We're always the student, never the scholar, Lord, always learning from you. But Lord, thank you for this family as we learn together, as we put these things before us, Lord, to learn. And Lord, I pray for each person here. Lord, you know each one that knows you, those that are struggling with you, Lord, those that are, those that are walking in victory and those that are just barely making it. And Lord, this is a family Lord, help us, Lord, to help each other. But Lord, looking to you together. And for you, there's some of you that are really struggling right now. God loves you so much. And there's a, there's a journey that begins with, with this first step. It's just saying, Jesus, help me. Jesus, come into my life. Lord, forgive me of my sins. Lord, help me to follow you. You put that in your own words. He's here. He loves you so much. For some of us, some of us, all of us, we ought to pray, Lord, give us a hunger for your word, a hunger, Lord, to desire to read your word. And Lord, give us your Holy Spirit to understand what we're reading. Thank you, Jesus. And Lord, always make this a safe place for us to learn about you. We love you, Jesus. We love you a lot. And we trust in you. Thank you for this family. Help us, Lord, to be there for one another. Help us, Lord, to listen for your voice. We love you, Jesus. We love you a lot. In Jesus' name.